Have you ever been taught that the third commandment, which says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord God in vain, means to not swear falsely by his name, or to not curse using his name? If you've been taught that, you've been taught wrong. So stick around as we uncover the ancient Hebrew meaning of what this commandment really means. Hello everyone, Jim Staley here, Passion for Truth Ministries. I believe this particular teaching today is going to bless you. We're talking about the Ten Commandments, and in particular, in this video, we're talking about the Third Commandment. Over 95% of Christians don't even know the real meaning of this commandment. Most of us have been taught it has to do with somehow swearing in God's name or cursing in God's name. But this is the farthest thing from the truth, although neither one of those are a good idea. So stick around with me for just a few more minutes. This is going to be a short video, but we're going to unpack what the ancient Hebrew really means and give us a deeper understanding of this particular commandment. But before we do, would you do us a favor and help us by subscribing to our YouTube channel, hitting the notifications to turn them on so that you don't miss a single video here at PFT. And then share this video with everybody that you know. It might just bless them. It's a great way and a free way to help support our ministry and get this message out there. All right, so without further ado, let's talk, well, let's turn, let's rather, to Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments section of the Bible. And let's go to verse 7. Let's talk about the third commandment. It says this in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. What exactly does it mean to take the name of God in vain? What does that look like? Let's dive into two important Hebrew words in this particular scripture that will drastically help us in deducing the real meaning. And then we're going to walk through the scripture very quickly on several other verses and come right back and reread this one with new eyes. So here we go. The first key root word we want to talk about in this section is the English word take. So when it says, you shall not take the name, that word take in the Hebrew is the word nasah. Nasah means to lift up, bring forth, to make high, magnify, or to raise. I like to remember the word NASA because in America here, we have an English word called NASA. It's our space program here in the U.S. It sends our space shuttles into outer space. And so what happens with a space shuttle? It lifts off, and that helps me remember the Hebrew word nasah, which means to lift up. So in this context, we're talking about taking God's name, lifting it up and magnifying it. We can't take God's name, lift it up, and then drop it and make it nothing to make it worthless. That brings us to the second key Hebrew word, which is the word for vain in that same scripture. That Hebrew word is shav, which simply means emptiness, vanity, false, worthless, common, useless, or desolating. So we're lifting God's name up, then we're desolating it. We're making it useless or common. How do we do that? Well, I'm going to suggest that it has everything to do with making an oath or a promise and nothing to do with cursing. Let's take a look at some scriptures. Let's walk through them. Here we go. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 25 says, It's a snare for a man to devote rationally something as holy and afterwards to reconsider his vows, meaning that we're not supposed to make a vow quickly, and then all of a sudden, when we do make a vow, quickly we realize, oh my goodness, I should have never made that vow, and we try to get out of it. And we can't because we gave our word and our promise. Back in the day before contracts really even existed, a handshake and your word were everything because it was backed by who you are. It was backed by your nature. Okay, so let's keep going. We're going to talk about that, the nature part, a little bit later. Proverbs 25, 14 says, Whoever falsely boasts of giving is like clouds and wind without rain. What does that mean? That means someone who is saying that, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you my word. The other person sees the cloud. They see the hope. And then all of a sudden, the cloud comes over them. They're expecting out of the middle of the desert just a drop of rain, and nothing comes out of the cloud. That's what it's like when we give our word and we don't fulfill it. We're hurting other people in the process. Let's keep going. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2 through 5 says, Do not be rash with your mouth. Let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. 
In verse 4, it says, When you make a vow to God, don't delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. It's better to not vow than to vow and not pay. And so this concept is all throughout the scriptures of making vows to God and making vows to people. Did you know that when you make a vow or an oath to someone else, you are in effect actually making a vow to God because he lives inside of you. It is his nature that has been imprinted and pressed into your soul. So everywhere that you go, you're carrying the light with you. And so when you give a bad representation of God, we're actually making his name void. We'll come back to that in just a second as we deepen this understanding. Deuteronomy 23, 21 says, When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it to the Lord your God, for he will surely require it of you, and it will be a sin to you. Did you know how many times, or I should say, do you know how many times we make vows to God? Even the very vow of coming to Christ from the very beginning is a vow. That is a covenant that we're promising to be made in his image. We're an ambassador. We're a servant. We are a representative of the Most High God. When we choose not to live our lives 100% for Him, we are drawing down His name. We're said to go to, we're trying to lift it up, but we draw it down and make His name no different than ours or anyone else's. Also, in this particular scripture, He says that when we make a vow to Him and not keep it, He's going to require it of us anyway. For instance, how many times do people say, I'm going to support the kingdom of God through my tithes. I'm going to make sure that we grow the kingdom and get behind ministries that are doing that in their their local church or what have you. And then they don't do it. And then somehow they have a medical problem, their car breaks down, they lose their money anyway. Here's the crazy part. We never even know that it's actually God fulfilling his word, requiring it of us anyway. I know that feeling. I've made that very same mistake. And then at the end of the week, we say, or at the end of the year, I can't afford to give to God. But the reality is, is all these things happen most likely because we dropped the ball and we didn't keep our covenants with the Lord. And that's just one example. When we make a commitment to someone, we need to keep it. Our name is on the line and his name, more importantly, is on the line. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 5, 33 through 37. It says this, many of you have heard that it was said To those of old you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, nor by earth, for it's his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no be no, for everything else is the enemy. Now, let me ask a question. Is he contradicting his own word? He just got finished saying that uh, what it looks like when we take an oath. Now he's saying we shouldn't take an oath at all? Certainly not. There's no contradiction in Scripture. There was simply a problem in the first century of people swearing on everything, from the capital, Jerusalem, to the temple above, to the rabbi, or to this rabbi, that rabbi, or even to their dead grandmother. There was swearing on everybody's grave and everybody's authority and everybody's name, including Jerusalem itself. Today, don't we do the same thing when someone challenges us? Don't some of us swear on this and that and even swear to God? We should never have to invoke someone else's nature. You only invoke someone else's nature when your nature does not meet the bar or the standard that it should reach. All we need to do is just tell the truth. You say yes or no and let people get used to you just saying yes or no. Just be honest all the time. You'll never have to swear on anything greater than your own word. Amen? (laughs) All right, now let's get to the key verse that really helps us with Exodus 20, verse 7. And that's Leviticus 19, 12, its sister verse. Read it with me. It says, You shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Let's read it one more time a bit slower. It says, You shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. What is this saying? This is absolutely the parallel verse to the third commandment, detailing for us exactly what he's talking about in Exodus 20. When you make an oath, you're bringing God's name into the situation, which if you're a believer, you're doing all the time. Every time we breathe, we're breathing God's name into that moment. 
If we make a promise and we break it, we're making his name worthless. This is the actual real meaning of the third commandment. In reality, it should really be read this way. You shall not make God's name void or common by making an oath or a promise in his name and not keep it. For the Lord will hold him accountable for making his name no different than any other name. That's how this should be interpreted based on the context of the original language. We should not lift up God's name by making an oath or commitment to someone where our reputation, and thus his, is on the line, and then not fulfill that oath. When we do that, we've made his name worthless. We've made it common. We've dropped it down and made it no different than any other name. It means our name carries no value. And when we do this because his name is carried in our name, it means we've made his name of no value. As believers, we're to take our time before making oaths and promises. And when we do, we're to keep those covenants and vows. And therefore, magnify the Lord's name in the process. I've got one more thing I want to share with you, and I think it's pretty cool, right before we leave. And that is, when we sign our name, our signature, on any kind of contract or covenant, we're putting down more than just our signature. Did you know that the word signature is made up of two English words, sign and nature? That's right. When you put down your signature, when you buy something on your credit card or whatever, you're putting down the sign of your nature. You know, when Jesus, Yeshua, died on a cross for us, His blood was the sign of His nature. He showed us by cutting that covenant, which is what the Hebrew word covenant, or Brit, literally means, that God cut the covenant and signed in His own blood, saying, in effect, this is my nature. I'm crucifying my flesh for you. I'm going to pay the debt that you owe. He made a promise and he kept it till death. The sign of his nature was life. What's the sign of your nature? What are you known by? I encourage you to look deeper into the third commandment and ask yourself, how much am I lifting up the name of God by the way that I live my life? Is the sign of my nature worth the same as the sign of his nature? Am I bannering and representing his name correctly in the earth realm? Or am I taking his name in vain? Let's keep our promises and live our lives in such a way that we lift up his name in the process. If this video has blessed you, I encourage you to watch this video and this video as well. And make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and turn on those notifications so you don't miss a single video that we put out here at Passion for Truth. Until then, I'm Jim Staley and I'll see you in the next video.